The achievements of human civilization are staggering. And they've been built primarily on the principles of free speech and the free market. It's true that the human record is scarred by censorship and slavery too. But our achievements really started to take flight once those ogres had been defeated. Yet now, in essence, those ogres are being revived. Censorship is rising and true freedom is retreating once more. The liberties we've long taken for granted have been eroded, and we can already begin to count the costs. We've seen all too clearly what happens when free trade and free speech are repressed, in the string of catastrophic socialist states that littered the 20th century. Yet they're under attack again, and that assault risks undoing all the colossal achievements of our ancestors. It's abundantly clear why the principles of free speech and the free market are so vital. Discourse leads to the exchange of ideas, and all ideologies must stand up to criticism to prove their real worth, while trade is the great driver of innovation, as all commerce is based on demand. But now those principles are under attack, and it's all starting to fall apart. And the assault begins, but it certainly doesn't end, with the state. History has shown us the benefits of a state. When large numbers of people cooperate, they can achieve great things. A well-run state can provide the security, stability and affluence for people to prosper, and to enjoy the comforts and liberties that make life worthwhile. But history has also shown that the state should not assume too many responsibilities, that when it seeks ever greater control over people's lives, it's a disaster, both for the population and for the nation as a whole. We've literally thousands of years of experience proving this. We've all seen the horror of states that try to control their citizens, in Stalin's Russia, Hitler's Germany, Mao's China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Castro's Cuba, Le Duan's Vietnam, Mengistu's Cambodia, and scores of other examples. Material conditions collapsed, while progress and culture virtually ground to a halt. There are almost no remarkable developments or artistic achievements that come from any of those states. But throughout history, We've seen less obtrusive states, ones that allowed artistic, economic and intellectual freedoms to flourish. And they have proved the greatest success stories in history. The polis of ancient Greece, the might of Rome, the city-states of Renaissance Italy, Japan in the Sengoku period, the golden age of the Dutch Republic, 18th century Vienna, Britain in the 19th century and the modern USA. These are the most successful states of all time, and they produce the most remarkable people. Socrates, Archimedes, Cicero, Lucretius, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Benini, Caravaggio, Rembrandt, Descartes, Mozart, Schubert, James Watt, Charles Dickens, Oscar Wilde, Nikola Tesla, Andy Warhol, Frank Sinatra, Thomas Edison, and Aretha Franklin along with scores of others. The message from history is quite clear, but it has been forgotten because our modern governments seek ever greater control. They desire to crush the independence and liberty that are essential for our states and our citizens to thrive. They're determined to impose a craven uniformity on their populations, one that will produce shrunken, terrified and obedient people. And they are succeeding. Nearly 200 years ago, John Stuart Mill said that a state which dwarfs its men in order that they may be more docile instruments in its hands, even for beneficial purposes, will find that with small men, no great thing can really be accomplished. How right and how prescient he was. There's a certain school of thought that's come to dominate our political class. It's predicated on safety above all other concerns, which makes it sound nice. 
but it's an excessively parental and stifling attitude that's simply gone too far. Every push for safety necessarily inhibits a freedom, and we simply must find a better balance in the current status quo. Instead, it rolls on like an insatiable monolith, like the recent imposition of 20 mile an hour speed limits across much of the UK demonstrates. This approach is utterly untenable, and the costs are starting to show. There are two critical fields where these failures are apparent, in both the recent pandemic and the issue of global weather forecasts. In both cases, our new elites grasped on the most alarmist predictions and the most extreme solutions. And in both cases, the flaws of those approaches are now undeniable. Their solutions, to lock down economies on one hand, while raising the taxes of the poor on the other, are reaping terrible consequences. Yet they seem determined to keep imposing the most severe diktats on their suffering populations. Inflation is soaring, energy costs are surging, and dissent and rebellion are breaking out everywhere. But rather than accept that they have erred, these dictatorial tyrants are doubling down. And they're aided by their accomplices in the media and Silicon Valley, who all largely sing from the same songbook, while advisory panels like the WHO, WEF and Davos elites add another layer of influence. The likes of the EU have been increasingly exposed as ineffective, stifling and bloated bureaucracies. And you'd have thought the fact that the world's economies have begun creaking, just as the World Economic Forum becomes more influential, might have sent out alarm bells to these people that their Great Reset is a busted flush. But the history of socialism proves to us that utopians are utterly immune to evidence. The failures of our current leaders are legion. Take the environment. We all want a cleaner planet, but our elites have surrendered wholesale to radical eco-extremism. And the green taxes they have foisted on us and their alarmist retreat from fracking and nuclear power among the greatest and safest sources of energy there is, has resulted in an energy crisis and soaring prices that have appalling consequences, especially for the elderly. Their insane pledges of net zero means that investment has collapsed and the result is an unprecedented crisis. Their legal reforms driven by wishful thinking and a blind faith in liberalism, have resulted in an epidemic of crime, with a bloody surge in shootings in America and stabbings in Britain. This ideology has also been soft on Islam, mealy-mouthed about any of the faults of that ideology, offering continual justifications for its worst crimes, while being vindictive and ruthless towards any of its critics. And their obsession with identity has done huge economic and cultural damage, with much artistic output swamped by tedious lectures and diversity quotas, while censorship and fear have strangled any true artistic expression. They've also caused chaos with their open-door immigration policies. Not that immigration's a bad thing per se, but the pace has been far too great, the numbers much too high, and the vetting process non-existent. The result is crumbling public services, crippling housing shortages and costs, and sharply rising tension, division and violence. The whole policy has been a catastrophe. Migrants are pouring in in numbers we can't possibly sustain. They're milking our overgenerous benefits and laughing at our naivety and weakness. And that weakness has emboldened the planet's worst tyrants, with Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping behaving with increased belligerence. The failures of our liberal elites are legion. They're among the worst in history. It's one thing to fail during a crisis. But they inherited states with unfettered liberty, prosperity, strength, stability and success. And they brought those marvellous civilizations to the brink of collapse. 
economies are crumbling, energy prices are rocketing, food shortages are escalating, and freedoms are being crushed, while our weakened societies are overrun and mocked by people who despise us. This is their legacy. It's not a case of if we will fall. It's only a case of when. All civilizations collapse, and ours is teetering on the precipice of disaster. Yet the rot runs much deeper than our leadership. There's much talk here of grand conspiracies, of James Bond-style villains pulling the strings behind the scenes. That really isn't how the world works. The world works on social relations. Most people want to fit in, to feel they belong in their chosen tribe. So they'll play along with the prevailing opinions and will perhaps eventually convince themselves that those ideas are correct. That's what's effectively happened here, as this big state, safe space mindset has come to dominate humanity like a virus. The state isn't orchestrating the cult of woke. It's been driven by it. These sectors are working in concert with each other, with one feeding off the other. This really isn't a top-down phenomenon. It's been driven from the bottom up. This is perhaps best explained by what's known as the left blob. In Britain, this mindset is omnipresent in all walks of public life, including the majority of the media, especially broadcasting, the civil service, the NHS, the legal system, education, most public bodies and private charities. And it's even taken over boardrooms. In America too, it utterly dominates the universities, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, the bulk of media, and is similarly polluting the corporate world. How this came about is a long, torturous process, one that began in academia in the early 20th century. It's perhaps too involved a tale for a video of this length, but I do give the story quite a bit of space in my books. Our societies are primarily driven by a million identical bureaucrats, all singing from the same song sheet, and new employees are browbeaten into conformity. The likes of Soros and Schwab don't set the agenda. They're following it as much as any faceless Whitehall or Washington drone. This is exactly why our politicians are so inept because they're followers rather than leaders, blindly traipsing after a directionless and brainless herd. Our political leaders have joined the tech giants, media, and the majority of the upper middle classes in a sort of woke mob, an identity-based cult certain of its views on everything, and full of disdain for the lumpen proletariat who fail to share their enlightened worldview. George Soros, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Justin Trudeau. None of these people are great thinkers. They may have more money and influence than most, but they're not formulating any novel plans. For all their grandiose talk, they just spout platitudes. They're following the herd as much as anyone. This is a cult without a leader, which makes it all the more dangerous. Because cults can die when the main man is exposed as a charlatan. Sadly, there's no chance of that happening here. There's no secret cabal. No clandestine meetings and arcane ritual. No grand sweeping conspiracy. Just a lot of unoriginal idiots singing from the same songbook. Because they lack the courage or intellect to deviate from the herd. It's why we get ostensibly right-wing governments like the Tories either surrendering to this mob, too scared to stand up to it, or simply unable to push their reforms through the civil service. This is no conspiracy driven by shadowy elites. It's a mind virus that's infected half of humanity. But the resistance is growing too, as the human race develops antibodies to fight off a clearly harmful infection. We're seeing this in Holland with the Dutch farmers' protest. The government decided to target farmers by arbitrarily slashing emissions of nitrogen oxide and ammonia. As these are produced by livestock, 
farmers will be forced to reduce their herds by such significant numbers that their businesses will no longer be tenable. The state, which has placed no such sanctions on the airline industry, doesn't appear to have considered the consequences of driving farmers out of business at a time of increasing shortages and economic hardship. It's remarkable obstinacy. And the Dutch farmers have rallied as the Canadian truckers did months ago when their freedoms and livelihoods were threatened. It's little surprise then to hear that Justin Trudeau is to impose the same restrictions on nitrogen as the Dutch because our political class have nothing but contempt for the masses they represent. As we saw in the UK with the gross and repeated attempts to sabotage Brexit, the single greatest mandate in British electoral history. In Sweden and Italy, the people have turned too. The leftists who have ruled unchallenged for generations have been turfed out, and a right-wing bloc voted in. A bloc opposed to untrammeled immigration, crippling energy taxes and censorship, and in favour of free speech and the free market. The people are speaking. They can see that our current system is no longer working. They can see that our arrogant overlords, who think they know best on everything, have failed. And this isn't an opinion. It's a fact demonstrable in every aspect of modern society. These people supported the catastrophe of BLM, the economically ruinous policies of locking down and green levies, and they seek to stifle and silence any dissent, even any questioning, with the eager compliance of their mainstream media and big tech lapdogs. But dissent and rebellion is beginning to break out across the globe. It remains to be seen where we're headed. Revolutions are a terrible idea, because they don't just destroy the parts of a state that are failing. Revolutions also break all the bits that are working. But our political class must listen to the grievances of the people and they must accept that their own big state approach and their economic measures are failing. It's imperative to roll these reforms back before it's too late. If you'd like to support this channel, please like, subscribe and think about buying my books. They go into topics like this in much greater detail. They're called The Tyranny of the Left and they're available on the links below. Please do feel free to pick them up and let me know what you think. Thank you.